Thank you. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce Jackie Close, who really doesn't need an introduction um, as the co-chair of the ANZ Hip Fracture Registry since it was created. She's the professor of orthogeriatrics at Prince of Wales in Sydney and has done an awful lot of research in falls. Um, I will introduce her because she's got a lot of slides to get through and Jackie's going to start now. Thank you, Hannah. Um, fasten your seatbelts, everyone. I'm more than happy to share these slides, so don't be taking notes or whatever. I'm very happy um, for them to be made available. So I'm just going to talk about delirium prevention and management. So delirium, it's common. It is the most common complication following hip fracture surgery. It kills brain cells. It takes away people's ability to live independently and it actually kills people. This is a very boring, but it is the correct definition that we currently use. Uh, this is the DSM-5 um, criteria for, uh, for delirium. So disturbance in attention and awareness, it develops acutely, short period of time. It's a change from their baseline. Um, they often will have additional disturbances in cognition, and it's not caused by an external cause, such as maybe a hit of ice or heroin. The irony is, despite the fact it is so common, we actually don't understand the underlying pathophysiology that drives um, the delirium process. Why is it one person becomes delirious with a urinary tract infection and another one doesn't? Lots of hypotheses that are currently being um, tested, lots of research in the area at this point in time. Some of the theories around neuroinflammation, imbalances in neurotransmitters, altered glucose metabolism. Some people believe it's actually a manifestation of, um, of subclinical vascular uh, events. But the, re the reality at this point in time is we don't know. Despite the fact we don't know what the underlying pathophysiology is, what we do know is there is nothing good about delirium. Um, in terms of hospital-related outcomes, um, th these are patients coming in for elective um, surgery in this particular study. If you have delirium or another complication, you are considerably more likely to stay in hospital longer. You are very definitely more likely to end up in residential aged care. That's one of the things older people most dread. You're more likely to end up in hospital or have any adverse outcome. So there's nothing, there's nothing good about developing delirium. This is a very recent um, meta-analysis. This is looking at the association of delirium in relation to subsequent developing of dementia. So a number of trials out there have looked to see whether there is an association between delirium and dementia. And what this paper shows is that you are significantly more likely to subsequently go on and develop dementia if you have delirium. Now, whether that's an underlying common pathway, nobody knows at this point in time. You're also more likely to die if you develop um, a delirium. So this is a, a paper from last year in BMC Geriatrics. And if you look at a surgical population of which the hip fracture population, of course, are, and you compare people who do and don't develop delirium, you're three times more likely to die um, as a result of that delirium and the consequences of that. So how do we do in terms of hip fracture care? So are we looking after the most or looking out and looking after the brain? Well, here's last year's report. Uh, and this tells you what percentage of patients are actually assessed for cognition prior to surgery. And actually 37% of patients, we didn't even assess their cognition. What about looking for delirium after surgery? So uh, just to reiterate, it is the most common complication um, following hip fracture surgery. 34% of patients we didn't actually assess for whether they had post-operative delirium or not. And lots of variation in terms of percentages who do and don't um, develop delirium. But the fact we're not even looking for it is a problem. So what can we do about it? So there's a number of trials out there that say that you can do things to prevent and better manage uh, delirium in a hip fracture patient. This happens to be abdominal surgery. This is an extension of what was originally Sharon Inouye's HELP program, which is the Hospital Elder Life program. 
This was a Taiwanese study um, which applied it to a surgical population undergoing abdominal surgery, and they were able to reduce the incidence of delirium. And how they did it was so simple. Three nursing protocols. The first one was orientating and communicating. So every time you went in to see the patient, you introduced yourself to the patient, reminded the patient where they were and what day of the week, etc. it was attention to nutritional status and to mouth care, encouraging people to clean their teeth. So we know that aspiration pneumonia um, is associated with poor mouth care and oral hygiene and getting people up and walking. So really simple things make a difference in terms of the development of delirium in the post-operative period. The HIPATAC study, now the HIPATAC study um, published uh, in April of last year, large randomized controlled trial, looking to see the benefit of expedited surgery for hip fracture patients. So they're looking at the patient arriving in the emergency department and being on the operating table within six hours. Now that would be a, a huge goal to uh, attain. Um, and what they were looking for um, in terms of their primary endpoint was actually a composite endpoint of mortality non-fatal myocardial infarction, PEs, pneumonia, sepsis, stroke, and other uh, life-threatening bleeding. Big study in the 69 hospitals, 17 countries. The median time to surgery for the intervention group was indeed six hours. Interestingly, the control group, um, their median time to surgery was 24 hours, so considerably better than many um, hospitals in this country. And the bottom line is it actually didn't work when you look, consider the primary endpoint. So it didn't make a difference to that composite endpoint and it didn't make a difference to major um, complications. However, there were some benefits um, with the hip attack trial. And one of those was a significant reduction in the incidence of delirium. So again, providing more support for expediting or getting on, not delaying surgery in older people. There've been a number of systematic um, reviews, um, again, all suggesting that there is evidence that a multifactorial or multifaceted approach to preventing delirium actually works. So here's, here's one from the Ger uh, Journal of the American Geriatric Society. It's a few years old um, now, and this is looking specifically in a hip fracture population, but there are a number of studies there providing evidence that you actually can make a difference. Um, again, separate, this is um, all cause delirium. Um, so the two that I've highlighted there are studies that specifically looked at um, a surgical population, but again, uh, multi-component, non-pharmacological. So the, we don't need to turn to drugs. Non-pharmacological approaches are effective in terms of preventing delirium. The problem with those systematic reviews um, is actually I'm not actually telling you what it is we need to do. So, so really I'm now just gonna focus on what sort of things do we need to do to significantly impact your risk of developing delirium, reducing its severity, reducing its duration. And it's everybody's business. Uh, a paper from BJA uh, last year, um, nice way of looking. Uh, it's a very structured systematic way of looking at where the opportunities are to reduce your risk of delirium. So what can you do before the surgery, during the surgery, and afterwards, and how do you manage people who have developed delirium? So a nice sort of systematic structured way of thinking about it. So my first piece of advice is actually invest time early in getting to know the patient. Um, and I would argue that if you do that, it will ultimately save you time. If you can prevent delirium, you will certainly make your life easier and much better for the patient and their family and carers. So what sorts of things can you do prior to surgical intervention? And it's not enough just to do one or two of these things. These all need to be incorporated into your existing hip fracture pathways. Introduce yourself, a very simple thing to do. Patients see so many um, healthcare professionals during their journey. Look for the big risk factors that tell you that somebody is at high risk of developing delirium. So increasing age, if you already have existing dementia, frailty, or you've previously had a delirium, you are considerably more likely or more at risk of developing a delirium in the post-operative period. So there's your big four um, already. Assess cognition and assess it using an objective measure. There are a number of uh, tools that can be used and they're not terribly time consuming. 
involve the family right from the outset. They know the person better than um, you do. They'll also be able to tell you if things are changing. It's a necessity to bring people's hearing aids and glasses into hospital so you're actually able to, to communicate with them and they don't have problems with, uh, with sensory deficits. Assess and manage pain. So Richard's going to be talking to us about pain management. It makes a big difference to the experience of the hip fracture journey for the, uh, for the older person. Use nerve blocks. And if you're delaying surgery for whatever reason, make sure you are repeating uh, your nerve blocks or pop in a catheter in if needed. And deep breathing exercises, good evidence that they reduce the um, incidence of post-operative pulmonary complications, more so in a population having abdominal surgery, but, but basal atelectasis and post-operative pneumonia is not uncommon in a hip fracture population. Feed and hydrate. So if you're not going to be operating on somebody who comes into the emergency department after midday, there is no point in fasting them. Let them eat and drink in the emergency department. Have pathways in place to allow that to happen. Nutrition as medicine, so again, some evidence to support um, routinely prescribing um, things like Ensure 2Cal um, to support people during that perioperative and immediate postoperative period. Is a catheter really necessary? It's a little bit more difficult in women getting on and off a bedpan when they've got a broken hip, um, but for men, it's very easy to pee um, in a bottle. Of course, the, uh, the reality is if you get on and operate, you don't run into the problem at all. Start laxatives from the point of admission to hospital. Don't wait till they haven't opened their mouths for, for three days and then you run into significant problems. Look at medications that are associated with an increased risk of delirium, particularly the centrally acting medications and anticholinergic um, drugs. And make sure that you've got prescribed regular and PRN analgesia. Establish limits of care and know in advance who substitute decision makers are so that you have a chance if somebody is going to develop a delirium that you've had a conversation with them in advance so that you are clear who you are going to converse with when you're not, if and when you're not able to have a conversation with that individual. And use interpreters um, if needed. Um, this is what we happen to use. Um, we use the 4AT, which is a very simple, very quick um, assessment of cognition and a delirium screen. So the, 4, the uh, AMT4 is a very, very brief cognitive screen where you ask the person the age and date of birth because your age changes every year, but your date of birth doesn't. You also ask them where they are in the current year. And then you're looking for levels of alertness, changes in levels of attention, concentration, and that acute fluctuating course that, uh, that is synonymous with delirium. Pocket talkers. So when people have difficulty hearing, it's important that you actually put in place strategies to be able to communicate more effectively. This is a pocket talker, $300. Um, very easy, simple to use. It's really just a microphone and amplifier with a headset of headphones. This is something developed by the CSIRO fairly recently. Um, so when you struggle or if you're struggling to get hold of an interpreter, um, either face-to-face -face or via telephone. Um, this, is a, this is an app that can be downloaded onto your phone, onto your iPad, called Called Assist. Um, a number of languages available at this point in time. I suspect that will increase over time. Um, and then you literally have the, um, a statement here, there's no interpreter available, I do not speak your language. And needless to say, if you've chosen Arabic, it'll be spoken in Arabic, not English. I've put it up there in English because most people I'm assuming um, can read English. You can also have it spoken though as well. So you can push that button and it will talk to the, uh, the patient. Interesting with the cognitively impaired patients, they actually think there is somebody at the other end. So, so not without its challenges, but again, if you're struggling to get an interpreter, there are alternatives available. Patient-centered profiling. So get to know your patient. If you've got somebody you know is high risk of delirium or has got underlying cognitive deficits, at the very beginning, start to understand something about them. So if they do become delirious and you're trying to manage them um, when families are not around, that you actually know a little bit about them, that you can converse with them on a level that is meaningful to them. Which, which soccer team do they support or what do they used to do um, as a profession, who are their children, their grandchildren? Uh, so this is the sunflower developed by um, ACI, which we frequently um, use for our high risk um, patients. Uh, and I would recommend it to you. So just go to the ACI website and put in sunflower. Um, very simple 
um, tool and makes a difference. From a consent um, perspective, uh, needless to say, uh, you want to feel reasonably confident that your patient has the ability to give consent. If not, you're looking for assent and a person responsible to be able to sign your consent form. Um, and I would argue that delirium should always be mentioned as a potential um, complication. So the incidence of delirium after hip fracture is anywhere between 25 and 40%. Um, percent. The system as well, so the system should be set up to cater for these people who come through the doors of our hospitals every single day. Early alerts in the emergency department um, to alert you to the fact that alert orthopedics and orthogeriatrics and anesthetics, the fact that there is a hip fracture in the emergency department so that we can start getting things in place um, before they hit the ward. Um, so the hip fracture pathway is an important thing to have, but, but a hip fracture pathway that traverses the whole journey um, and the reality is the whole, of course, is better than the sum of its parts. Where possible, have scheduled trauma lists. Um, I know that's not possible in every single um, hospital, but it certainly makes it easier for, for planning. And we really do need to make sure we've got staff who are adequately trained uh, in preventing and managing um, cognition. High observation um, rooms, so a lot of hospitals will use high observation rooms um, where you've got an increased level of staffing. Um, to keep an eye on those people most at risk. And there isn't a place, of course, for alarm devices for those people who are impulsive trying to get out of bed. Simple things like clocks that you can actually see and that they also have a date on. Contrasting um, toilet seats so that people can actually see um, where the toilet is. Clear, clear signage in the hospital. For people going down to theatres, we'll send the pocket talker down with them if they've got hearing impairment. Allow a family member to accompany them down to the operating theatres. Operating theatres are very scary places for, for people. Um, they can only, of course, a family member can only go a certain distance, but at least having somebody familiar with them can make a difference. And put in the notes the identified contact person so that if recovery or are struggling to manage somebody who wakes up floridly delirious, that actually the person, the carer, is more likely to be able to settle them than a recovery nurse who's meeting them for the first time. The, uh, the BGA paper I mentioned earlier um, has a summary of some of the effective interventions um, around the pre and perioperative period of time. There's evidence to support the use of paracetamol. There is evidence to support the use of non-steroidal. So geriatricians tend to be very risk averse when it comes to non-steroidals. But if you've got a patient who doesn't have any renal impairment, doesn't have any heart failure, non-steroidals do have a role as part of multimodal analgesia. The debate around general and spinal goes on and on and on, but there is some evidence to suggest that uh, regional anesthesia may be better, but there will be people who feel differently. Some evidence for the use of intraoperative use of dexmedetomidine, um, Preoperative comprehensive geriatric assessment seems to be associated with better outcomes. Uh, avoid prolonged fasting. It is better where you've got somebody who's at high risk of delirium, popping them first on the list so that they are back on the ward early afternoon um, before it gets dark and where carers can be involved in the immediate post-operative care. And avoid intraoperative benzodiazepines. We've known for a long time that benzodiazepines um, and associated with an increased risk of delirium, but they also prolong a delirium. Here's some evidence that the longer the surgery takes, the more likely you are to develop a delirium. So I would put to you the argument that for those people at greatest risk of developing a delirium, so that could be your person from residential aged care with underlying cognitive impairment who's 90 years of age, you want the senior surgeon, not the junior surgeon who's learning to do a DHS operating on you because it'll make a difference in the post-operative period um, by reducing their rates, their incidence of delirium. Early removal of catheters. Um, so lots of stuff, particularly in the geriatric world, oh, we'll leave the catheter in until the bowels are open. Now, most people do not come into hospital um, chock-a-block, um, constipated. There's really no evidence to support it. Yes, some people will develop urinary retention, but it is much better to promote early removal of catheters than have patients who develop a delirium removing the catheter for you. 
Restraints are not an acceptable way of practicing and it is relatively uncommon now, thankfully, um, that we'd see anybody being restrained. But just remember when you're lying somebody flat on their back, um, the slide on the right here is essentially what you see. That's not really very orienting um, for somebody who's at risk of developing a delirium. So more often than not, it's better to sit people up so they can actually see what's going on. So if you're lying in there, that's all you can hear. Um, pain scores. Um, so people um, with a delirium or underlying cognitive impairment, they may not manage the average pain score. So don't forget to use um, things like the pain ad score or the Abbey pain scale. Bowel and bladder function is important. You should be documenting people's bowel function every day, knowing what's happening. Um, the Bristol stool chart is what we um, traditionally use and also look out for urinary retention. So we still see urinary retention on a regular um, basis being missed. Uh, so have a bladder scanner on your ward. Nutrition is important. So not only just using medications, uh, nutrition as medication, but there's also a way about the way we present um, our food. So on the left there, you've got your average pale tray, pale plates, plastic covered, very difficult to, to access. Uh, so somebody who's already cognitively impaired or maybe developing a delirium will struggle to access food. Um, and on the right, um, I took that photo last week. There are 10 different supplements sitting on that um, patient's tray. That's really unappetizing. So I think we need to be careful and think about the way that we present food to people because we also eat with our eyes. And we should have available snacks, flavored milks and finger foods um, for people. Early mobilization, lots of evidence around um, early mobilization, including evidence that reduces your risk of developing a delirium. This is not a paper that is specific to hip fracture care, quite the opposite. It's a very new paper, only just out, really just highlighting the benefits of music um, therapy in terms of improving sleep quality. So more evidence to support this than there is to support the use of benzodiazepines. Um, in older people who have trouble sleeping. And not surprisingly, it's uh, sedative type music um, that is more effective. I'm not saying that this is directly applicable to a hip fracture population, but it is something to think about as one of the strategies you might want to employ if people are having difficulty um, sleeping. Some exciting things on the horizon. Um, so this is a paper that uh, was published in February, I think of this year. Um, and this is to try and prevent delirium. So this is a study, this is people undergoing laparoscopic um, GI surgery and using intranasal insulin as a way of regulating cerebral glucose metabolism. So there's a lot of interest in that uh, and we're certainly doing some work at Prince of Wales in this area, but this is a paper from China. Uh, and what they were able to demonstrate is for the two days prior and the morning of surgery, People administered intranasal insulin, short-acting intranasal insulin, were significantly less likely to develop a delirium in the post-operative phase. So clearly more work to be done in that area, but promising in terms of number one, understanding the underlying pathophysiology, and number two, a potential intervention that actually is relatively simple um, to administer. There's another study that's on its way. Um, this time it's aromatherapy. Um, so an, an, a non-pharmacological approach to managing um, delirium. Um, we wait and see what the results of that may be. This is for the intensive care unit setting. So I'm going to conclude by saying, be prepared and invest time early. Simple things really do matter. Often a delirium is the product of the way that we deliver care, and that is something we can change. Understanding why something happens is crucial to making sensible, smart um, decisions. And the days where you dismiss delirium as a temporary setback in somebody's journey are well over. It is associated with poor outcomes in the short and longer term. So we need to take it seriously. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, a number of things that you've said have resonated with me in the past. I come back. Oh, 
So salicoxib, I'd really encourage people, um, despite our usual reluctance, to try that. And we are using a lot more of that and finding that that works really well in the most high risk. Um, and I think that's really important. Now, there's a number of questions about pain, which I might send to Richard and let him answer in his talk. There's a really good question about does hypoactive or hyperactive delirium have a worse outcome? Hypo, hypoactive tends to have worse outcomes. Um, they're, they're often seen as the, the nice, well-behaved patient on the ward, and they often get missed because they're lying in bed, not causing any problems to anybody. But the reality is they're not eating, they're not drinking, uh, they're becoming constipated, etc. So they are harder to diagnose, they're later diagnosed, and it's much more difficult to, to manage in terms of getting oral intake, maintaining hydration, keeping bowel and bladder function uh, manageable. They struggle with um, swallowing, so they're more likely to develop problems with oropharyngeal dysphagia, um, prolonged holding of food in their mouth, more likely to develop an aspiration pneumonia. So hypoactive is worse in terms of outcomes. Hyperactive are more, diff the patients are more difficult to manage from a nursing perspective, but it's the hypoactive ones we worry about most. Yep, I agree entirely. Um, do you know if the hip attack has looked at the subset of people with dementia and seen if expediting surgery for those makes a difference? No, I don't think, yeah. it, ha I don't think it has. And hip attack two is focusing on re uh, people at, uh, looking at cardiac outcomes uh, and people with raised troponins. Um, so I don't think we're going to get the answer in hip attack two. But, but the reassuring thing about the hip attack it just continues to add support. We just need to get on and operate on these people. Yeah, and look, at it, again, I've had discussion with a number of people at some of the meetings we attend. The people I, we prioritise up the list are the people with the agitated dementia who are really suffering with the pain from their hip fracture, yeah. uh, above people who are well, who are more likely to complain, but actually um, more likely to be um, unaffected by a delay. Um, the other question that's been asked that's quick and easy for you to answer is how often should you measure a 4AT? Well, in theory, you shouldn't be using it repeatedly. So if you read the original paper and the instructions as to how you're meant to apply it, the argument is that there is a learning effect. But I must say my experience and many others is actually um, there isn't much of a learning effect when you're applying it to a hip fracture population and in fact if the patients are able to tell you what questions you're about to ask then they're probably absolutely fine but for most people that I see there is very little in the way of a learning effect so I personally will use it prior to surgery and at least the first couple of days post-surgery unless they're still delirious in which case I keep track of it it's, it's a very simple quick tool um, to use and it's built into our electronic medical record now as well so you can see what happens over time yeah, agree completely. I think we could add time it takes to complete 4AT by the patient um, as another measure, because I think it'd be a bit like the timed up and go. The really good ones will do it very quickly and it actually takes no time. That's the benefit. Brilliant. I think we're right. Person. Sorry, I was saying that that's the benefit of the same person applying the tool each day is whilst that is the timing part of it is not part of the actual test. You absolutely do get a feel if they're able to whiz through the months of the year backwards when the day before they got them all right, it took them 30 seconds, you know they're getting better. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. That was a really comprehensive talk and um, really useful and gave us some practical tips.